So a recent Gallup poll in 2021 showed that 39% of employees feel engaged in their jobs. And that's up from 36% in 2020. And 2021, there was a shift called the Great Resignation, where reportedly 40% of all employees either left their positions for new positions, or in some cases left the workforce altogether or left their fields altogether. What do you attribute these really huge changes to? Well, I think the first and overriding theme is uncertainty for everybody. You know, it used to be there was this pretty good separation between work and your personal life. And some of that had to do with physical location. Right. So you could take your hat off or take uniform off and you could throw it in the back seat and walk into your house and kind of be, you know, away from the workplace. And I think now that with the remote work, with the blurring of the professional, the personal, the social media, all, everything is so much more intertwined that the uncertainty of COVID, the pandemic, Omicron, Delta, all of those things, it's like every day is almost a new day. I hate to say that in, in the workplace. And so feeling engaged, you know, I look at the opposite side of the coin, which is because everything's blurred, disengaging from work because now they're having to go, okay, I'm working for this hour remote. Oh, I've got to run to the bank. Oh, I've got to take care of the kids. Oh, I've got to pick up, you know, from daycare. In, instead of having this block of work that you're locked into and then this block of family time, it's now just little bits and pieces. And so I think some of the disengagement is because we're shifting our focus across the personal and professional so much. Um, I may have kind of a contrarian view, but when you're working remote it and you're not in that, I don't want to say touchy-feely, but that closer human connection, it's much more difficult to be engaged without the human connection and the proximity. And I think people are striving and hoping to kind of come back to the office to a certain degree because that human connection, that breaking bread, that sharing coffee, it's very hard to measure that in the way of engagement, but who doesn't like bumping into somebody in the hallway and catching up? And so that's all gone. And so that has to take away from your level of engagement in the workplace. So would you say then that perhaps, because when you look at the statistic, it's 36% or 39%, depending on the year that you're looking at, that's a third, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's a third, third is not actually it's not a high number you know you would hope that the workforce at large would feel would be like at 70 percent. most people feel engaged so if i'm hearing you correctly would you agree that perhaps the some of the disengagement is because of the fact not necessarily because leaders are doing a bad job of engaging their people but rather because of the fact that now we are our days are just are more bifurcated between work and personal. Would, would you agree with that? I absolutely or would you say would it's like, no, this is a, or is it a leadership issue? Well, I, I would say first, I would agree with you because everybody's got to remember that leaders are still people too, and still facing their level of engagement. You know, it's hard to do in audio, but I used to do this drill and this is the best way that I would bribe kind of the disengagement engagement model is if you put your hand out in front of you and you put your thumb like up in front of a wall painting or something and focus on your thumb, get it in focus. Now shift and look at the painting and bring that into focus. Go back to your thumb, get that in focus. Go back to the painting, do it once or twice. Now try to get both in focus. And they both blur to a certain degree, which is your head going back and forth between multitasking. And it's kind of the same way that works engaged. So you, even leaders, it is a leadership problem, but they're facing the same issue. How do I motivate? How do I engage? But how do I balance that I'm remote? I've got kids. I've got a life. I'm now having to fit it all in along with a million and one. So, you know, one minute we're fully engaged, but I think the numbers are really because, you know, 
we've now just shifted what the workplace means. Hmm. And it's my hope that that engagement level comes up and that leaders over a period of time learn to be more authentic, learn to be more connected by the means that we do have and make much, much better use of every single personal interaction that you have. And they double down on leadership and taking care of people. Then I think you'll see the engagement come up, but between uncertainty and that engage, disengage, engage, disengage between work and personal, it's a lot to ask of leaders. And I would say this, it's now bringing the focus more towards what good leadership looks like in a company. Do you think it's a positive? Do you think these shifts are a positive or a negative? Ultimately, I think they will be a positive. From a leadership perspective and some of the coaching that I've done and what I've shared with some of the executives that I coach is that, listen, there's no getting around that this is a very, very difficult time. It's a very, very uncertain time. But those are the things that build your character. Those are the, or reveal your character. This is when you learn. This is when you experience. This is when you grow. It, it's an old cliche. Nobody grows when they're comfortable. So if, if you're a leader and you're wanting to get better, it may seem very, very painful right now, but I think the positive is this is going to make much better leader out of most people because they're going to have to adapt. They're going to have to learn. They're going to have to be more authentic and connect and work with people a whole lot more. And I think those things, even if they're not trying to be better, it gives them a whole new environment to improve and deliver within. What are some of the other talent trends that you're seeing right now? My goodness, the talent trends. Well, of course, getting good talent. When I've talked to a couple, and I'm working with a couple large talent acquisition organizations, and at least one of the positive trends that I'm seeing is that people are no longer taking for granted or have stopped taking for granted, at least the smart ones, that you can just post on Indeed or LinkedIn, here's the name of our company, here's the role, here's the great benefit. Now HR, now hiring managers, now talent acquisition specialists are now really having to dig in and say and learn and be able to sell why somebody should move their career to your firm. They're actually having to dig into the weeds as to this is no longer just a job. Mm-hmm. And, and so if you know the talent that wants to work now has a lot of choices, a lot of choices. It is a candidate's market like I have never seen. And so that's placing on a bur- that's placing the burden on hiring managers, leaders, HR, talent acquisition to really say, listen, this isn't just a job. This is a great tribe that you need to join. Let me tell you how this is going to benefit you down the road. And people also, oddly enough, aren't selling, hey, come here for 10 years. They're now saying, this is the next leg in your career. Let us tell you why this is going to benefit and be a great thing for you to put on your resume. So it's a, that's the one positive trend that I'm really seeing. And leaders and managers, the ones that I speak with and at speaking engagements, they're now listening when I say it's no longer good enough for you to be, let, let me flip it a little bit. We've all gone into interviews where you feel like you're on the hot seat and the senior leaders are now realizing I can't do that anymore. I really do have to bring an employee value proposition and talk about why somebody should work for me as a leader. They're now listening to that. And I think that that improves the leadership. I think it improves the culture. And now it's easier for candidates because they're more in control to ask what that place is like. So there are some good things that I'm seeing out of it. Yeah. What about on the leadership side? What kind of things are you consulting on, speaking on? What kind of problems are you solving on the leadership side? On the leadership side, whew, wow. Uh, narrow down that bucket. Um, <laughs> because now, because of you know all of the uncertainty and the great resignation, the engagement that we talked about, it's always a host of issues and every person is different. But generally, number one, It's how do we attract talent? How do we sell ourselves? That's number one, what people are coming to hear me talk about. And so, you know, 
I, I got to tell you, it is, it's so much fun. And, and I'll give you a first example. I had a CEO in the audience. He's like, you know, what is the number one thing, the number one thing that I can do? And I said, well, answer one question for me. Why in the hell should I work for you? And the CEO was like, oh, you saw this look of panic on his face. And I said, that look of panic, that's exactly it. Why should people be working in your company and for your leaders? And so people are coming to me asking me, how do we do a better job of articulating who and what we are, what our purpose is, what our value is, and what our contribution to you know, our clients and customers is? The, other, the second big thing is, how do I lead and how do I manage performance in this more remote flex environment? So we, you know, with executives, I'm talking a lot more about communication skills, authenticity, empathy, certainly listening, um, and talking to them about the value of good communication and not just one-to-one and Zoom and things like that, but now every email, every town hall, every fireside chat, every time, because they don't see you in the hallways, people aren't in the workplace. So every medium of communication is so much more important. And I'm helping them maximize a lot of that. Just curious, in this remote environment, how much, and, and, and you mentioned that communication is vitally important. And I violently agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say violently, like intentionally. Um, I'm just curious to know how much communication do you think is lost in this medium? Like if you were to put a percentage on it, let's assume that you and I are in the room and we can see our body language and we can hear our vocal inflection and we, you know, we can see eyeball to eyeball truly like we're in the same room. If that, if that, if that reflects 100% of a communication, what do you think remote, remote connection, remote communication is? If you were to put a percentage on it, just curious. I'd say you've lost a third to 40% mm. e easily through these mediums. And a simple tip, although you, you know, we didn't ask about it, but one of the things to the earlier question and to this one is what I've told people, because you lose so much in the communication, that 40% via Zoom, Teams, WebEx, whatever it is you're using, we, the one thing I hope and I'm coaching leaders to stop doing is they go from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom to Zoom. We've all been a part where, hey, they're running late. The last meeting hasn't closed out. And I've said, you know what? Change your meetings to 45 or 50 minutes and have a hard stop. And for each one of your meetings, especially the one-to-ones, take five minutes and prepare for that meeting. Don't jump into it cold. Actually say, you know what? Hey, I'm going to have a conversation with Mark. Okay, what are the things that, that I want to make sure Mark and I cover? And, you know, and one of my first questions I write down when I'm coaching is, okay, what great things, what wins has Mark had since the last time we talked? It's how I open up the communication. And so even though I might lose less than most people, I'm trying to move that number as high as I can. How much information can I get and how much authentic communication can the two of us exchange? And it comes through preparing for those Zoom calls instead of Zoom to Zoom to Zoom to Zoom to Zoom and getting Zoom fatigue at the end of the day. Right, right. I want to shift toward the, the hiring process a little okay. bit. And, you know, before a person gets into an interview, you know, they submit a resume and you've 80 plus thousand hires later, you've reviewed probably well over, I mean, I can't even imagine you're now in the probably hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of resumes that you've reviewed. What are those things that would cause you, and you are actually more thoughtful about resumes than most. So mm -hmm. what are those things that would cause you to eliminate a resume right off the bat? You'd say, no, just no right away. You don't, you wouldn't even look at them. What are some of those things that are just uh, an immediate no? An immediate no. The first thing for me personally is generally embellishment. All I want ultimately when looking at a resume or through an interview is to have a very accurate an authentic picture who I'm considering. 
or who I'm assessing. And so resumes that are embellished, you know, all kinds of symbols of awards and certifications and stuff, it's like a big ego statement. So what I really want as, you know, doing an executive search and even, you know, a few clicks down is just tell me who you are, your competencies and the things that you've experienced. I have a preference for functional resumes versus chronological, by the way, because chronological, I have to look and it's very time consuming and, and it does hurt people. Now, junior people, chronological is fine. Senior people, it better be functional. I, I need to see the competencies, the major accomplishments certifications, awards, you know, and areas of expertise. But anytime that you embellish, I'm getting, you know, world renowned for like, okay, well, I've never heard of you. So that's, you know, not that I should know everybody, but when you embellish, it's the first turnoff. I actually don't like pictures. I don't like fancy graphics. The aesthetics of the resume are just simple name, you know, phone number, Well, you know, most people will leave that on, but I don't need all different symbols and colors and and beauty. It's just conveyed the basic information to me. And and most recruiters would, I think, would agree with me. They'll take it from there. So when you're preparing uh, a candidate, you know, how do you prepare a senior leader? You do a lot of coaching, Mm -hmm. uh, preparing people for executive, executive roles on up. How do you prepare those folks for, for interviews? What kind of advice do you give them? So there's two things. Uh, first, I make sure that they understand the difference between an objective requirement or an objective asset and a subjective asset. An objective asset is a point of fact, ranked number one of 50 sales leaders globally. Okay, that's an objective fact that somebody can track down or ask you about resilient is subjective. And so for executives, and let me back up a little bit, the number one mistake that every single candidate from an entry level to an executive makes, the number one mistake is they don't know themselves. They just don't. They don't know what makes them tick, or they may know, but have never taken the time to articulate it. And ultimately in an interview, remember, your accomplishments are what you did in the past. They're a good indicator of what is probably going to occur in your world in the future, but they're not necessarily, but your character attributes and the subjective assets are because they'll tell you where you're going. So when I coach executives, it's like, number one, I want you to go through and you can start with your resume and list all of those great things that you've done. And I said, don't put timestamps next to them, by the way, because when they occurred, is not important. It's the what you delivered. And then I want you to make a list of 10 top subjective assets and then go back to each one of the bullets and write, how did you do it using the subjective asset? So that's where the resiliency, the drive, the collaboration, the effective intelligence, the curiosity, the strong communication skills, the problem solving skills, conflict conflict resolution, all of those subjective assets now start coming out as answers as to the how they accomplished the objective trait. And so what ultimately I'm trying to build in that executive is no matter what question you are given, that it's muscle memory in your head. Okay, I have this question. I go, to, I go in my brain file cabinet and say, here's a relatable accomplishment. I pull that out as an answer. And these traits over here align to this company's values. I paired them up and I deliver an answer. And it's an authentic answer of how they actually accomplish things. Now, be, once I get them to know themselves and practice, the other thing I do teach them, and I am just death on this, I hate the STAR method. Oh my God, the situation, task, action, result, answering questions. Bottom line up front, answer the question as directly as you possibly can and then add context. Most people will talk and I tell it, here's what I tell executives. Do you have kids? Have you had a friend? Have you had a coworker, a subordinate? Have you stood in front of your partner and the longer you talk, the more guilty you knew they knew you were? 
that's an answer gone wrong. So learn to articulate, here's the result, here's the traits that helped me achieve that, and here's what I learned from it. And so that usually just dials in executive to understand what a company is hiring is their traits in delivering in their environment. Does that change for people at the functional level or would you say it's pretty much the same? I, I think it's the same. A resume is just really this sales sheet. It's like a, uh, a sticker price on a car. Here's all the great things that come with the car. It's, you know, all it is is about the great things that you've done. But an interview is going to be, who are you? What makes you tick? What drives you? Because you're always going to run into fire drills. You're going to run into lack of budget, lack of resources. Things didn't go as planned. One team may not have delivered because they had a budget problem. How do you react and still deliver in difficult business situations? Because if a business is easy, yeah, you're fine. That, that's not what we're worried about, about when we hire somebody is when things are going smoothly, do you have all the money in the world? Yeah, everybody is generally okay. What we want to know is, does this person bring something that when things get challenging, tough, or short timelines, that they will deliver? Yeah. What are some of the universal questions that a person ought to be prepared for with an immediate answer? Uh, the first one that everybody needs to know is, why should I hire you? Now, you may not get asked that directly. You may get asked, you know, we're looking at this role, you know, what attracted you to this role? It may come that little bit off the mark, but it's all about why should we hire you? So you really have to know what is it about yourself and your attributes that relate to this role, to this team, to this department, to this firm to deliver. And most people want to talk about the resume versus, hey, this is, you should be talking about, you should hire me because what you're going to see day to day is this driven, resilient person that is a team player and a team builder. Now, that's very simple and cut and dry, but point, to make the point, why should somebody hire you? You need to know that. Second, how do you learn where have you failed? There are so many senior leaders. You're going to get some kind of failure question. You're going to get some kind of weakness question. And number one, I tell executives, it's not a confessional. For those of you that are into Catholicism, you're not going to get absolution after the interview that, hey, you have a weakness. You're, you know, go be weak no more. You actually need what they're looking for is self-awareness. What have you learned along the way? And when did you make a mistake that was hard on you, hard on your team, hard on the company that you had to learn and recover from? And the weakness question, by the way, and let me, let me share that one with you because most people hear the question, tell me about a weakness, whatever form that comes in is, what are you stuck at? That's not the question. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you have these five things, that are just absolute strengths of yours, anything below those is an opportunity to improve. So we're not asking, what are you bad at? We're asking, what is it that you're always trying to improve to make a strength? And when people think of it that way and deliver an answer that way, you come off as very self-aware, you come off as humble, and you come off as somebody who, hey, I don't have all the answers, but I'm gonna figure it out and when I figure it out, I'm going to pass on that information. I'm going to store that information. And I'm going to use it to be better. So I've asked you a lot of questions today, mm -hmm. George, and I'm really grateful for the time that we've spent. Do you have any final thoughts for our viewers and listeners about what's happening today, things that you're working on, things that are coming up for you, any, anything that's on your mind? Well, let me share with you, I, uh, I was working with somebody pro bono the other day, and they were at a firm that I coached, and they decided to exit. And they were one of the people that I was coaching, and they asked for some career advice. And so as part of the great resignation, 
I want to share something with people that are searching for a new job. That yes, it absolutely is the candidate's market. It absolutely is. But here's the buyer beware statement. Everybody that is in my profession is really under the gun to fill roles. And that doesn't, we are a very ethical profession. We, we really care about our companies. We care about our candidates. We always want to do the right thing, generally speaking. I have not run into that many bad recruiters in my life, surprisingly. Maybe they're not the most organized, but they do have a passion for what they do. That said, when I'm talking to a candidate, I'm going to make that opportunity look as best as I can in an authentic way. There will be some people that embellish. And so things in the market are going to look better than they usually do. So my advice to her was, if you're going to be a candidate that's searching for something, that you should write an intention statement. It has been my number one tip in coaching executives or executives that I talk to me that are in the transition or considering the transition, which is you have to define success. Most people do it the reverse. They go to the job market, they go to a job board, or they start networking. Here's what I would like to do. And they have this really nebulous, gray, foggy idea. They know what income they need. They know what kind of pay they need. That's really the only thing they truly know as a fact. But I say, you know, put all of that aside, put industries aside, and write an intention statement that says, my next best role, and describe that. Describe where a, a role where you delivered your passions, where you enjoyed your work, where you enjoyed your coworkers, what kind of culture. Write all of those things down and get that into the most succinct, short, one, two paragraph statement you can. Then look at the job market. Because so many people get stovepiped into industries or they see a flashy job or they see, worst case scenario, is they see a very well known top brand with a lot of cachet to it. And they think, oh, I got to go work there when it, it actually may be the worst thing for your career. So for candidates, if you're in that great resignation and you're looking to leave, you need to define what success looks like for you first and foremost, before you hit the job market. And as I've said, I think we said it in the book and I've said it a million times over my career, which is If you've ever gone to the grocery store hungry, those double stuffed Oreos look very nutritional and very, very good for you. And we all know they're not, but that's what happens when you go to the grocery store without a list. It is the same analogy when you go to the job market, not knowing what success looks like, what's going to deliver for you personally and professionally and financially. If you don't describe it before you go to the market, otherwise you're in the grocery store without a list and everything's going to look better isn't necessarily going to be that way for you. That's a great response, George. Thank you so much. And thank you for taking the time with me today. It's always great to talk with you. I always love it. It is a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Hey guys, thanks for watching and listening. Hit the subscribe button and you'll never miss an episode. And check out some of these other clips from the podcast.